This morning we begin with an acknowledgement of our Indigenous territories. Long before those of us who are settlers and those of us who are descendants of settlers came to this land, there were people here. Many nations of people lived and live on the land that we call Canada, given responsibility by the Creator to be stewards of this land and all that lives on it. We know these people as the First Nations. Today we remember what it means to live thankfully. As we remember what it means to live thankfully, let us give thanks to the First Nations of this land wherever we might be right now. And let us remember that at Westminster, we worship God on the historic and unceded territory of the Neutral, the Anishinaabwe, and the Haudenosaunee of Six Nations. As Christ's people, let us be people of love, of truth, and of reconciliation. Welcome, friends, to all of you who are joining us either via Zoom on this um, it's a very rainy fall day for us here where, where I'm at. Um, and welcome to those who are joining us later through YouTube. Um, I have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you this morning. Actually, I have uh, quite a few announcements I'd like to share. Um, the first is just a heads up that this coming Wednesday at 4.30, uh, from 4.30 until 8 o'clock is the last food truck of the year. Um, so this is the final um, truck and we will be um, then we'll be without uh, any food trucks on the Wednesday night um, throughout for the rest of the year, which makes sense because it will start to get quite cold and very dark very early. Um, but I encourage you to come on out. Um, hopefully we have some decent weather and um, Everybody practices uh, physical distancing and wearing masks, um, as do, of course, the folks who are, are the food truck. And um, it's a great way to kind of connect with the community while still maintaining some safe distance. And 10% of all the sales go back into the Cedars. Um, next Sunday, we are going to be uh, celebrating Thanksgiving together. And as part of this Thanksgiving, um, we will also be giving thanks to one family who will be leaving us, um, Carrie Martins and um, Alicia uh, Bueller are going to be moving to Manitoba as uh, Carrie has begun the process of becoming admitted as a ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. She's already ordained in the Mennonite Church, but would like to join the United Church of Canada. And so as part of that, they're leaving us. Uh, so as part of uh, saying thank you and goodbye, um, Carrie and Alicia will be offering a time of a children's time on the theme of Thanksgiving. So next Sunday, we'll have a Thanksgiving children's time for those of you who have children in your life um, or those of you who just really enjoy children's time be on the lookout for that. Um, I also want to give you a heads up uh, just in case you need a little bit of time. Today's service includes communion. So if you didn't already know it can uh, we have we were celebrating communion. I just want to give you a moment. Um, now if you have some bread and some grape juice with you then fantastic. If you don't have bread or grape juice with you then I would encourage you to grab whatever bread-like product you have and any liquid product you have to take part in our communion. So um, grab whatever you've got if you don't already have something and uh, toward the end of our service we'll be celebrating communion. Um, another thing I just want to let you know about, we just recently found out that there's been a bit of a movement um, to send thank you cards to the, um, the farm workers who have been working um, on, on the farms and living at the United Church of Canada Retreat Centre, Five Oaks. Uh, when Five Oaks had to close for retreats due to COVID, they opened their rooms to be a comfortable quarantine housing for the migrant workers. Since April, they've had 278 14-day isolation cares for men and women, and they currently are hosting 43 men who commute to and from the farm. 
these men will head, head back to their homes on October the 15th. And so we're being encouraged to send thank you cards, especially as uh, we're about to celebrate Thanksgiving. Um, I just asked Paul if he would include the mailing address um, to our chat box. Um, and we'll put that in the comments section once this gets put on YouTube. Um, but for those of you who can't access either of those, just know that if you look up the mailing address for Five Oaks in Paris, Ontario, you can send a card there, care of Michael Schuberg, who's the director, and, and make sure, give a little note that it's for the farm workers or our migrant friends. We'd like to do a poinsettia fundraiser um, again this year of course, while maintaining uh, physical distancing. But in order to get to the minimums, we um, need, really need to join together with um, another congregation um, so that we can get some uh, better minimums um, and join together as a group. So if you know of any congregations that you have an in with, um, if you wouldn't mind being able to approach them and see if they'd be interested pardon me, in joining us, um, and talk to Jay um, uh, if you have any uh, questions or want some details for your, your friends. So, um, friends, one final um, announcement I just want to share is a bit of a preparation for our call to worship. Um, as part of the liturgy of communion, we often share the peace. Um, what, even if we were physically together, we wouldn't be able to share the peace the way we normally would. And we are not physically all together, so we cannot share the peace the way we normally would. And so I'm going to teach you, if you don't already know, the American Sign Language way of saying peace be with you. So you'll need to know this for the end of our call to worship. So it's a couple parts. So first, the peace part is a two part. So you start your hands kind of crossed like an X. And then it, you just flip them over and then put your hands to the side so that all that together is peace and then be with. And then since it's a plural you, it's kind of a you with you all. Peace be with you all. So peace. be with you. And then if you'd like, the response and also with you is just a, you know, kind of like a, sorry, a hang 10, <laughs> your pinky and your thumbs up and the rest down. And then you just kind of put a line and just kind of like, and with you, also with you. Okay, so let's try that one more time. So it's peace. Be with you all and also with you. All right, so that's coming up very shortly, so you don't have to remember that for too much longer. All right, friends, I would invite you now to sit back, uh, put yourself on mute, and we'll join together in our first hymn from Voices United 460, All Who Hunger. Yeah. 
If you have a candle nearby, I'd invite you to gather it and uh, join with me as we light our opening Christ candle. This morning, we celebrate Holy Communion along with our siblings all across the globe. And so we light our Christ candle to remind us of the light that God sent into the world, the light that came because God so loved the world, the light of Jesus the Christ. As we light this candle, we are reminded of that light God sent and the light that shines within each and every one of us, connecting us with all people in all times and in all places. I invite you to join with me in our opening call to worship. And please uh, try to remember uh, the passing of the peace that we we just went over uh, earlier. The spirit of God passed over and it was terrible and scary and wondrous. The spirit of God came and those who listened to God were safe. The spirit of God calls us here to worship creator, son and spirit. We come, we worship. As we gather together to be fed in body and soul, we start by renewing our community and exchanging words and actions of peace. As we gather for worship, we greet our neighbors with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we come together this morning or whenever we might be joining to remember. We come to remember your people. We remember the plight of the Israelites as you saved them from the bondage of slavery. We come to remember Jesus's life, his death and his resurrection. We come to remember the places within our world that are in pain and struggle right now. And we come to remember that we are never alone, that you are with us. We remember that even though at times we may fall short of your expectations and our expectations, that you forgive us always, that nothing we can do can ever separate us from your love. We come this morning remembering, praising, and giving thanks. And as Jesus showed us your mothering love, O oh God, we pray in the words he taught his friends as we say, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of Exodus, um, chapters 12 and 13. And we have a little bit of a reader's theater um, for this. So we will have four characters. We have uh, Lord One and Lord Two, just the same God, but uh, two different voices breaking it up. And that will be Clyde and Janet White. 
and we have um, our narrator and we also have Moses and our narrator is Wayne Johnston and Moses is Marguerite Johnston. So I invite you to sit back and hear the promise of Passover. When God decided to free the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt, God did not do so quietly. God rained fire and death upon Egypt, passionately claiming God's people as God's own. Here is the story from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the Israelites, of human beings and animals, is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day, which is the day that you came out of Egypt, out of the place you were slaves, because the Lord acted with power to bring you out of there. No leavened bread may be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going to leave. The Lord will bring you to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. It is the land that the Lord promised your ancestors to give you, a land full of milk and honey. You should perform this ritual in this month. You must eat unleavened bread for seven days. The seventh day is a festival to the Lord. Only unleavened bread should be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread and no yeast should be seen among you in your whole country. You should explain to your child on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It will be a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead so that you will often discuss the Lord's instruction. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with great power. So you should follow this regulation at its appointed time every year. October the 4th. In a growing movement from coast to coast to coast, October the 4th has become a day to remember missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls all across Canada. Now, this day of remembrance is even more poignant after hearing about the racism that led to the death of the Indigenous woman Joyce Eshaquan at the Atikamek, the Atika, an Atikamek woman who went to a Quebec hospital earlier this week with stomach pains and ended up dying while listening to racist slurs against her. 
A 2011 Statistics Canada report estimated that between 1997 and 2000, the rate of homicides for Indigenous women and girls was almost seven times higher than for any other Canadian female. Compared to non-Indigenous women and girls, they were also disproportionately affected by all forms of violence. They are also significantly overrepresented among female Canadian homicide victims and are far more likely than other women to go missing. The statistics before 2010 are almost non-existent, but in the last decade, the statistics have been gathered more and more frequently. And according to a 2016 CBC News article, Canada's Minister for the Status of Women, Patty Hajdu, said that based on the Native Women's Association of Canada, the NWAC report, and originally collected by the 2008 Walk for Justice initiative, the estimated number of Indigenous women and girls who have gone missing or who have been murdered in Canada since the 1970s is uncertain, but could be as high as 4,000. Now the RCMP report estimated that that number would be approximately 1,000. The CBC News report in 2016 said that activists working for the Walk for Justice initiative started collecting the names of Indigenous women who are missing or murdered, and they ended up stopping their count when they got to 4,232. Compare and contrast this with the RCMP's estimate of 1,000. Patty Hasdu says that Historically, there have been under-reportings by law enforcement of cases of murdered or missing Indigenous women. The National Day of Remembrance of Missing and Mur Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, October the 4th, is a day to honour the work that has been done, to remember the women, the girls, and the Two-Spirit people who are missing and murdered, and it is a day to continue to work toward justice for the most vulnerable people in our country. Now, while statistics feel quite dry, it is the stories of these women, girls, and two-spirit people that remind us how important this day of remembrance is. Now, at first read, our scripture reading today feels quite dry. In fact, it was so dry that I thought, um, having one person read the whole thing might, um, we might lose a few of our viewers. So I asked um, the Whites and the Johnstons to share in helping to bring a little more life into this dry reading. Um, this reading from the book of Exodus is a detailed account of how the Israelites were to celebrate that first Passover. This reading contains the exact day to begin the process, exactly what to eat, who to share it with, how much to eat, how fast to eat, what not to eat, and what to do with any leftovers. At first glance, this reading is as far from inspiring as we could probably get. And yet it is a story that begins a nearly 4,000 year old tradition of celebrating the Passover. At first glance, each item listed in the reading from Exodus seems a bit like overkill. Like God thinks the Israelites can't quite figure out how to cook and how to eat lamb. However, as with everything else, it seems, there is deep meaning in each of the prescribed items that God lists. In describing when families must share a lamb, God is ensuring each family, regardless of financial ability, is able to eat. The families with more means shall share their meal with families of less means. When talking about how the lamb should be divided amongst the people who are gathered, God is ensuring that all members of the household are valued equally. When directing the Israelites to burn any leftovers, God is instructing them to leave behind a life of waiting and hoping that the Egyptians will give them just enough. God is telling them to trust that they will be given enough from God because they no longer have to rely on their oppressors to provide for them. These seemingly obscure instructions have deep meaning and caring within them. 
This Passover account from Exodus 12 and 13 has been named the most important reading in the Old Testament because it is a text that defines who God is in the Old Testament. The definition of God, the one who brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. This is reiterated in that very first commandment given to them later on in the desert. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. In the Old Testament, God is the one who redeems God's people from bondage. In the Old Testament, God is the one who delivers God's people from oppression. One of the most important elements in the story occurs at the end of our reading for today. You shall tell your child on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Telling the story in every generation that God delivers those who suffer from oppression, that God works for the flourishing of the world is a central task for those who trust in God. God wants the generations that come to know that God does not let God's people stay in suffering, that God hears the cry of the oppressed, of those who are enslaved, of those who are tormented. God knows that it is all too easy to forget the trials and saving acts of those who have paved the way forward. So God tells them to repeat this story so generation after generation after generation will know that God will never leave them. In this way, repeating this story of Passover is not only a way of saying we remember God's liberation of the Israelites, but every single year, every single generation, through this repeating of the story, participates in that act of liberation, of salvation from God. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, we remember. Today, we also celebrate worldwide communion. And those words, we remember, have a different ring to them for us. Every single time we take part in communion, our prayer includes those words we remember. Even the very first communion partaker is included in those words we remember. We remember that on the night before he died, Jesus ate a meal with his friends, his disciples. The act of Holy Communion comes to us from Jesus' last supper with his disciples, a supper that occurred at the Jewish celebration of Passover. In this way, our acts of holy communion are remembrance of God's acts of liberation and salvation, a remembrance of God's act of deliverance from bondage for the Israelites, as well as a remembrance of God's liberating power from death and evil in Christ's death and resurrection. Now, just as our Jewish siblings are not only remembering, but also participating each year at Passover, we too are also participating in liberation when we remember through communion. When we celebrate communion, we participate in that first supper Jesus had with his disciples, that release from the bondage of sin, of death, and of evil every time we take communion. It is not just a remembrance. It is also a participation in that saving act of God that reaches all the way back to the story of Passover when God freed, liberated, and saved our ancestors, the Hebrew children. Now, prior to the reading we have today from Exodus 12 and 13, God had sent nine plagues to the Egyptians to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelite slaves go to freedom. Nine plagues that did not change Pharaoh's mind. Pharaoh stayed firm that they would not be freed throughout all of that. Our reading today is the beginning of that 10th and final plague, a plague that finally set the Israelites free from the bondage of slavery. Now, as we continue to live throughout our own plague, coronavirus, 
May we remember that God works within plagues to sustain God's people and to bring about life and liberation for all. Today is a day where we remember many important things. It is the day where we remember that first Passover. It is a day when we remember worldwide communion and it is a day when we remember the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Remembering is important. Remembering is a way that we see forward a new future. On Worldwide Communion, we join with our siblings across the globe to remember. We remember that it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. We remember that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. We remember that God is with us, that God is with all who are oppressed. And in the Holy Spirit, we are joined together to bring about God's kingdom here on earth for all people, especially the most vulnerable, like the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. On this day full of remembrance, may we be filled with God's power, with God's spirit, with God's call, leading us forward, remembering the past, participating in the past, and bringing about God's liberation for all in the present and in the future. Thanks be to God for the gift of remembrance. Amen. Before we head into our time of communion, I would invite you, wherever you might be, to settle yourself and to breathe deep, to feel your lungs filled with air, to feel your body filled with the spirit, and to release all that holds us back from being God's holy children in this world. Let us pray. Faithful God, today, we remember your fulfilled promises retold amongst people across the world. On this day of communion, as bread is broken and raised, this is the bread of affliction that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Whoever is hungry, let them come and eat. Whoever is in need, let them come and conduct the Seder of Passover. Today, we remember the promises you have given to all of your people. And we pray for all people who live under tyranny, for those who know deep oppression, for those who seek freedom, but know only captivity. We pray that all might know hope and that those who enslave them might find their hearts softened to seek freedom and human dignity for all. We pray for all who know human slavery today, for young people trafficked across borders and sold into the sex industry, for children forced into marriage and for people working as bonded laborers. We pray for those who are forced to become migrant workers. We pray that your spirit might be with them all, that they may know your promise of liberation and that we might be part of your call to liberation. God, on this day, we remember the life of Joyce Eshaquan, 
And we pray for her family, for her husband, for her children, for her community. We pray for all Indigenous people who heard her cries and see themselves, knowing this is a very distinct possibility for their future. We pray for all who face racism every day. We especially pray for those who are dying and going missing because of racism. We pray that you might break open our hearts and souls to find a way to eliminate systemic racism and our personal racisms for all that divides us. God, in this time where we live in pandemic, we continue to pray for all who are affected by coronavirus. We pray for those who have lost jobs. We pray for those who have lost homes. We pray for all healthcare workers and first responders and essential workers. And we pray for all who are living with coronavirus, who are suffering. As we continue in this second wave in Canada, help strengthen us to find courage and hope as lockdowns begin to increase. Protect our children in schools, protect the teachers and the staff and the administrators. And be with us all as we continue to find ways to connect and to share love while also protecting one another from this virus. God, we thank you for the many ways in which we continue to be able to connect, even though they don't feel like the perfect solution. We are thankful to have one another. We pray these things as we remember in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, our time of Holy Communion has come. And so if you have some form of food and some form of drink of bread or juice or whatever it might be I invite you to bring it close to yourself. For Holy Communion this morning I invite you to lend Christ your table, your bread or your food, your cup and your heart. For in this holy ritual, whenever and wherever we might be, we are connected. We are one bread, one body, one cup of blessing. Though we are many throughout the earth and this church community is scattered in your many kitchens and living rooms and our sanctuary, rest your hands lightly upon these communion elements, which we set aside today to be a sacrament. Let us ask God's blessing to be upon them. Gentle Redeemer, there, there is, is no lockdown on your blessing and no quarantine on grace. Send your spirit of life and love, power and blessing upon every table where your child shelters in place that this bread may be broken and gathered in love and this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live in us that we might live in you. Breathe in us that we might breathe in you. This morning, friends, we remember we remember that Paul, the apostle, wrote letters to congregations throughout places that we now call Greece, Turkey, and Macedonia, and that they were the first remote worship resources. 
Our online service this morning has a long heritage. The communion words sent to the church at Corinth from Paul were these. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was handed over, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In that same way, he also took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us, in our many places, receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. We, we are, are one in Christ, Christ in the bread we share. Let us, in our many places, receive the gift of God, the cup of blessing. We, we are, are one in Christ, Christ in the, the cup we share. The gifts of God for the people of God. As Cynthia plays some music for us to reflect within, I invite you to share in your communion elements. Let us pray in thanksgiving for this meal of grace, rejoicing that by the very method of our worship, we have embodied the truth that Christ's love is not limited by buildings made with human hands nor contained in human ceremonies, but blows as free as the spirit in all places. Spirit of Christ, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread 
give us courage to speak faith and act love, not only in church sanctuaries, but in your precious world. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope, even in the midst of pandemic. Wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies, spirits, and hearts need healing. And let us become your compassion and safe refuge. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our final hymn from More Voices 173, Put Peace into Each Other's Hands. to our week. May for you be it a week of blessing, where your hearts are full, your mind might be at rest, and your soul stirred into action. And as we continue on our day and week, may you find God the Creator guiding you, Jesus the Son walking alongside you, and the Holy Spirit inspiring you all of your days. Amen. Thank you. 